Hello there my RPG lovers and welcome to another video. Previously on Hidden Gems or Trash. This is business, Tal, not pleasure. So suck about the gameplay. <laughs> Sorry, what about the gameplay? The cheesy nature of the game really got to my head. That's how I like it, honey. Oh yeah, pretty much all female characters in this game are supermodels, and I ain't complaining. Would you judge me so quickly? Oh, it's bad. Alright, thanks for the lesson, bitch. Well, yet another episode of Hidden Gems or Trash. What the f is that? This is the series of videos where I play some obscure RPGs and action adventures. You can check out the full playlist if you missed previous videos, and I just want to thank you for all the suggestions in the comments about games that I could include in this series. You guys have been extremely helpful, and feel free to continue suggesting games. The list of games I want to cover constantly gets bigger because of you. Anyway, let's not waste any more time on the intro and get right into it. Number 5. Warlander Nothing can stop the harvest of this world. Warlander is an action-adventure with roguelike elements, released in 2020. If you're one of the OG subscribers on this channel, you might remember some videos I did for this game back in 2019. I was very invested into Warlander back then, especially because the development studio was very close to where I live. So I had a chance to visit the studio, do some interviews with the creative director, and even test the alpha version of the game. It's kinda of funny because it feels like an eternity ago, and back then I only had around 13k subscribers. The people from Clock Drive Games were very friendly, and I had a lot of fun while doing this. Here's a little fun fact for you. Goran Rajšić, the creative director for this game, was also the director for Genesis Rising, the Universal Crusades. Mandalore Gaming recently did a review for this game on his channel. I had no idea about this until I watched that video. Anyway, the whole premise of Warlander was very cool and unique, but I think they made a crucial mistake, which might be one of the major reasons why this game failed. From the very beginning, this was supposed to be a linear action adventure with some interesting action combat mechanics. However, they decided to completely change the whole genre of the game basically, very late in the development. They replaced the linear progression with roguelike elements. Which kinda made sense because this genre of games was starting to get really popular and it would give the game a strong replay value, on paper at least. However, the initial reception for this game was not great and around 7 months after the game released, it got delisted on Steam, you can't buy it nowadays. Now, I understand that linear action adventures are not exactly the most popular games nowadays, but I'm still convinced that this game would do a lot better if they just kept the original idea. Especially because the gameplay was pretty fun and unique, even though it did require a lot more polish. So let's finally talk about the game itself. Warlander follows the story of a guy named Bruce and a sword named Ferguson. Yeah, the sword you use is an actual character and it communicates with Bruce throughout the game. Who's that? Show yourself. Already at your back. In the intro cutscene, you learn that Bruce has received some amazing powers upon death, and he gets resurrected as a servant of the forest. Bruce seeks vengeance, and Ferguson is there to guide him. In the release version of the game, the story is spoon fed to the player at certain progression points. Speaking of points, if you ever played a roguelike game, you'll know exactly how Warlander works. You get a branching tree of levels, and you choose where to go next. It's a pretty basic roguelike philosophy, and it was a bit boring if you ask me. I don't know if that's because I played the early build of the game, and I know it was supposed to be a linear action adventure, but roguelike elements in this game felt very tacked on and out of place. The gameplay was supposed to be the main selling point of Warlander. The sword fighting requires to be precise with your attacks, and there is an extremely satisfying mutilation system. You can cut all body parts of enemies, and it feels great when it happens. What doesn't feel so great are the controls. I think this is one of the biggest problems with the gameplay in Warlander, and one of the main reasons why it got mixed reviews. The controls feel very sluggish, and there is an obvious input lag, which just makes the experience a lot worse. Moving Bruce around feels like you're moving a tank, especially when you try to strafe. As soon as you press A or D, Bruce will stop for a second before he decides to move in that direction. 
it totally breaks the flow of movement. On top of that, the game feels very drank in some specific combat situations. The camera won't follow Bruce when the ragdoll effect happens, the execution mechanic turns your camera abruptly and there are some similar, specific situations where your camera is not working great. They obviously needed more time to polish the controls, the camera and the game in general, but none of these problems were unfixable. If you could ignore those issues and when you get the hang of it, the combat gets very satisfying. I think they did a great job with the core mechanics. Aiming your hits was the most important thing in the game. Certain enemies will have armor protection and you need to aim at naked body parts. <laughs> well, that came out wrong. You had horizontal and vertical attacks and aiming is very precise and responsive. Until the camera gets in the way sometimes. The game definitely had a specific learning curve and I'm all up for that. It didn't feel like anything I played before and I can appreciate that. The hits were very precise and when you get the hang of the basic controls and aiming, the action felt very satisfying. Cutting off limbs in this game never got boring. Vorlander had a decent amount of different enemy types, which you have to fight in a specific way and use unique abilities that Bruce can acquire. Speaking of which, when you get at certain points on the roguelike map, you will get to improve your skills. Cutting off limbs is not only a visual gimmick, this is actually the way you get resources you need for improving skills. It's a pretty cool idea. As for the other gameplay features, you'll get a slight character improvements in roguelike style. And when you die, you'll have to start all over again, because that's essentially how roguelike games work. The boss fights are a hit and miss and they can really highlight all the problems with the controls I mentioned before. However, the abilities that Bruce can use are well done and they all feel like they have a clear purpose. Another major problem with the game was the lack of content. I mean, the game was released in early access, so that was to be expected, but unfortunately, we're never going to see the full potential of Warlander. It's been completely abandoned and delisted on Steam, which makes me really sad actually. Number 4. Viking Battle for Asgard Viking Battle for Asgard is a hack and slash action adventure, first released on last gen consoles in 2008. Four years after the original release, this game got a PC port in 2012. That's the version that I've been playing and I can tell you right away that this is a very lazy PC port. The game is capped on 30 FPS on PC for some fucking reason. Although if you can accept that, the frame rate never drops below 30 FPS mark. I ran the game on 4K with no issues, so that's something I guess. On the other side, Viking Battle for Asgard is very ambitious with all the NPCs he tries to put on the screen at once. Even in those sweaty situations, the FPS stays at 30. But the frame rate is not the only reason why this PC port is very bad. The game tells you in the beginning that you should use a controller, and of course I totally ignore that and play with mouse and keyboard. I actually tried to use my PS5 controller, but the game just doesn't recognize it, it requires an Xbox controller. Since I currently don't have one, I had to play with mouse and keyboard and it only made my experience worse. However, the gameplay can be fun in this game for a while, but let's start from the beginning. Viking Battle for Asgard has a Norse mythology setting, surprise surprise. A very generic Norse setting with very little story elements. You play as a Viking called Skarin and your mission is to stop the goddess Hel and her army. There are a couple of cutscenes after you complete a map and there are three maps in total, so the story is not exactly deep. The cutscenes are okay and you will also talk to a couple of NPCs here and there. And almost all of those NPCs look the same, by the way. I honestly didn't care that much about the story in this game. The gameplay on the other hand is also not very good, but it's not bad either. This is another game on the list where cutting limbs of enemies is a major part of the combat. Skarin doesn't have a huge arsenal of weapons or skills, but the core of the combat is solid, although very clunky and shallow. The gameplay reminds me of Shadow of Mordor, in a way. The idea for it, at least. You get a couple of simple attacks that you can combine, a block with a timed dodge and a very limited amount of combos you can learn by spending currency you obtain throughout the game. You can definitely have some fun with this combat system, but it gets very old very fast. 
I think the biggest problem with the combat is the balancing and the lack of enemy types. Fighting a couple of enemies at once is very easy and you almost can't die if you just spam your combos. However, fighting a large group of enemies is way harder if not impossible. The combos you can learn can totally trivialize the fights, but you also have to spend your resource in order to use stronger combos. The resource regenerates by striking or killing enemies, I'm not entirely sure, it's actually quite forgiving. There is a finishing move that you can perform which makes you invincible and this is when Skarin starts chopping enemies in half, beheading them or something similar to that. It's very cool when it happens, but like I said, it quickly gets very repetitive. I don't think the repetition in combat is bad, but in order for action combat to remain fresh, you need more unique enemy types and at least some customization and character progression. Unfortunately, the customization is non-existing in this game and character progression is very shallow with just a couple of combos you can learn. Most of the time you can totally ignore those new combos because you can kill enemies with the most basic attacks. You can't see their health for some reason and since this is a 2008 action game it has a lot of quick time events. Ah yeah, the golden age of quick time events, we meet again. This game requires you to spam a single button like crazy for the most mundane activities you can do in a game. Opening a chest or a cage, spam the button. Wanna use the fast travel point, spam the button. And of course, some enemies have QT sequences in combat where you need to, you guessed it, spam the button. It's totally ridiculous and I hate it with a passion. Speaking of activities, you're going to spend 90% of your time rescuing vikings from a cage and eventually attack a big place of enemies. That's essentially the whole gameplay loop. I can count different enemy types on my one hand and I would still have some fingers to spare. The hack and slash action works pretty good when you're not fighting more than a couple of enemies. That's not exactly what you wanna hear in a hack and slash game. The AoE damage is almost non-existent which makes fighting larger groups of enemies very tedious or even impossible. Although when you get in those situations, the game usually expects you to have an army on your sides. However, there will be some specific situations where you can get yourself in a very large fight and you'll certainly die because running away is very hard. Probably because the damn game doesn't have a run button, this is all you're going to get. Surprisingly enough, there is a stealth system that turns on automatically. Skyrim will automatically crouch where enemies are close, which allows you to come from behind and kill the enemy with one hit. It works okay, but you can't exactly play the game as an assassin. This game has three bosses in total, if I'm not mistaken, and it even uses them as elite enemies from time to time. To be honest, I played way worse action adventures with QTEs, let's just put it that way. The time dodge is done very well and I like the timing for it. Some of the combos are pretty cool as well. Like I said, there are three maps in the game in total and all of them look very uninspiring and generic. The last map has snow, so that's something I guess. Overall, it's a very mediocre game, but I didn't hate it. Like I said, I had some fun with the gameplay, but it quickly gets old. You can finish this game in about 10 or 12 hours, depending on how you play it. I would not recommend checking this game out today, but you be the judge. Number 3. Shadows Awakening Pain gives me strength. Shadows Awakening is an isometric action RPG that came out in 2018. After playing this game for a while, I can say without a doubt that it's one of the most underrated isometric action RPGs that I ever played. I never heard about this game before until people suggested it in my previous videos. First of all, what the fuck is this name, man? It's very stupid and kinda generic. Putting that aside, Shadows Awakening has some very unique features which really caught me by surprise. This is actually a party-based action RPG. Well, kinda. You usually get to control one character in Diablo-like action RPGs, but Shadows Awakening allows you to have up to four characters in your party. 
as you progress through the game, you unlock more characters and you can choose how to build your party. Some of these characters will be locked on your playthrough, so if you want to experience everything, you'll need to do multiple playthroughs. However, you don't get to control all of the characters at once. You can instantly switch between them and use their unique abilities or even combine them. I mean, this is nothing revolutionary, a bunch of JRPGs and recent gacha games also have similar party mechanics. But still, I believe this is the first isometric action RPG that I played with this feature. Unfortunately, Shadows Awakening doesn't leave very good first impressions, which might be the reason why this game flew under the radar. It takes a while until you get a full party of characters, and the core gameplay mechanics are pretty underwhelming. But let's talk about the story first. Jaska, your soul now resides within this demon. It will try to control you. But it is also bound to your will in ways I do not yet understand. The story was surprisingly interesting, although a little bit all over the place. It can be very confusing, and even the characters don't know what the f is going on. This is very confusing. You get used to it. The game starts with a mysterious person who summons you from the Shadow Realms. And by you, I mean the demon called Devourer. The Hooded Man tells you that you have common enemies and that you need to possess one of three long dead heroes. This is where you get to choose your main character and I first started with the warrior but when I got the feel of the action combat I quickly changed my mind. I really didn't like the melee combat in the beginning so I switched to the ranged character. I started a new game and I selected the ranger class which feels a bit better in the beginning. Anyway, this choice is important from the story perspective because each of these three heroes have a unique storyline. I found the story interesting overall and a lot better than I expected, especially for a Diablo-like RPG. Although some of the chapters will focus on different party members you picked up along the way and the game just expects you to keep on with the story. It all happens very fast, which can be pretty confusing. On the bright side, there is a ton of optional dialogue that you can select, which can help you understand what's going on, but still, that's not an excuse. I just think the story could have been presented a bit better, which would make it a lot more enjoyable. The writing ranges from ok to pretty stupid sometimes. The voice acting is inconsistent, it starts out pretty good, but a lot of characters have very mediocre and sometimes bad voice acting. By the way, Troy Baker is one of the main voice actors and to be honest, I don't think he did an amazing job with this character. Most of the time he sounds like he's delivering his lines through text to speech. Wherever Mara can be found. The cauldron will be also, but she is too powerful. While she possesses the crucible of souls, there is no hope of recovering it, I'm afraid. You are not his quarry today. He will not risk pursuing you if it might mean losing me. Head for Temuria if there's a way to destroy the crucible of souls. The whole story has a more comedic vibe and it doesn't take itself too seriously, which certainly made the story more enjoyable for me. Now let's talk about the gameplay. Like I said, the gameplay doesn't leave good first impressions. This is another game on the list that has slight input lag, which obviously makes the gameplay less responsive. On top of that, the gameplay itself leaves a lot to be desired. It feels very clunky and floaty, especially for a Diablo-like action RPG. Controlling my character never felt smooth like in some other similar games. I mean, it's not awful and you can certainly find a lot worse examples out there, but that doesn't make the game any better. This also depends on which character you play with, because some of them feel better than others. Controlling the demon feels way more responsive because he's a lot faster. But you'll feel the same clunkiness, if that's even a word, when you start using his abilities. Speaking about the demon form, this is one of those unique features. When you switch to the demon, everything around you changes. The environment, the enemies and puzzle solving is also affected. When you get stuck, it's usually because you'll have to do something in demon form. And like I said, you get to fight different enemy types although for the most time they feel exactly the same, just with a different skin. You will even see enemies that your normal characters can see, but they remain frozen in time until you switch back. And what I found really cool is that you can use some of your abilities in this form which will affect all enemies, even the frozen ones. For example, I can quickly switch to the demon and use the freeze spell and if I switch back to my regular character, the enemy will remain frozen. That's not the only case with the demon. For example, if some of your characters have certain buffs, you can use that spell and it will be active on whatever character you switch. That's definitely one of the coolest features of this game. You can only use 3 spells at once with one character, which felt really underwhelming in the beginning. 
but when you get a full party of 4, you basically have 12 spells at your disposal. It all depends on how you switch your characters, and how well you use your energy resource. It takes a while to get used to, but once you get the hang of it, the gameplay becomes a lot better. Compared to the beginning at least. Unfortunately, it takes a while for that to get in motion. I can see why a lot of people would quit the game before they get the full party, which is essentially where the game actually begins. That being said, I think the demon form gets very old very fast. It was very cool in the beginning, but later in the game I almost completely ignored it until I absolutely need to use it. The combat is a bit faster with the demon, but it doesn't feel that good and some enemies are kinda annoying. A lot of bosses in the game take the advantage of the demon form, meaning that you usually have to break some barrier in the demon form until you get to damage the boss with other characters. I don't have anything bad to say about that, I like when games try to use their unique features as much as possible. Speaking of bosses, they are okay. I only hated a couple of them, like when you have to completely avoid the boss and run in circles like an idiot. The party of 4 characters make the game really flexible in boss fights and the gameplay in general, although sometimes you won't get to control all of them. And that's one of the biggest weak points of the game, because having 4 switchable characters at once is the major thing which makes the gameplay solid, despite all the issues I mentioned about the gameplay before. I made a horrible decision in the beginning by selecting the old school mode, which essentially turns off the quest marks. That's how I usually prefer my RPGs, but if the game is not designed around that philosophy, it only makes the experience a lot worse. The quests have pathetic descriptions of what you need to do, and you can run in circles a lot just because you didn't notice that you can use a lever or something. Don't ask me how I know. This could have been easily avoided if the game had the button to highlight all the interactable objects. You know, like almost every single Diablo-like RPG ever. Putting that aside, I did like the map design. The maps are not huge by any means, but they are not linear either. Combined with the nice visual style of the game and the unique Shadow Realm with the demon, Shadow's Awakening is still a pretty game to look at. Overall, I would recommend trying out this game today. It has enough unique features that you might like if you enjoy playing isometric action RPGs. Just don't expect to have an amazing character progression like in some other Diablo-like RPGs. The itemization is decent, you'll get a bunch of different loot for all characters, but it never felt that important to the game. You'll get to unlock a decent amount of different abilities for all characters, and you have some passive abilities as well. All of that is presented with a very nice UI design. I played this game on hard and it felt pretty balanced, there is a decent amount of challenge. Even though some of that challenge comes from the clunky controls and mediocre action in general. Number 2. Blade of Darkness Blade of Darkness is an action adventure that originally came out in 2001. In 2021 we got a remastered version on Steam and that's the version that I've been playing. I wanted to cover this game ever since it got a remastered version I just never got around to. There is a lot to love about Blade of Darkness, even though it's obviously very outdated. The visuals are very primitive for today's standards of course, but that doesn't bother me personally. It actually grew on me the more I played, and despite the outdated graphics, the game still manages to create an amazing atmosphere. An amazing dark atmosphere that really puts you in a certain mood. I mean, it's right there in the title. When you start the game you get to choose between 4 different characters. They all have different weapon specialities, strengths and weaknesses. They also start the game on different maps, but eventually all of them go through the same routes. I only played the game with Turrican because he prefers two-handed weapons, just like myself. Although I could use a bow with him and the majority of weapons I found during my playthrough. This game is all about the gameplay, even though there are some cutscenes when you get to a new location as well as at the end of the level. To be completely honest, I don't remember anything about the story, even though I did like the vibe of the cutscenes. Four creatures are awakening from the dormancy and spreading terror and destruction. The darkness has returned and the end is near. That's the main gist of the story, according to Wikipedia. It doesn't matter a lot because this game is all about the gameplay. Some people will say that this game is the granddad of Souls-like games, although I would disagree. 
Blade of Darkness can definitely be very challenging and there are some similarities with Souls-like games, like the energy slash stamina system. However, the gameplay in this game leans towards hack and slash style. At first the combat feels very odd and not so precise because of the controls and stiff animations, but if you give it a proper chance it's not so hard to get used to. At least that was the case with my playthrough. The combat is all about different combos and unique weapon abilities. There is a decent amount of different weapons to pick up and all of them have something unique. You have a menu with all the combos and learning how to use them in combat is very satisfying. Although once I found something I really like, I rarely switch my tactic in combats. For example, I love this sidestep with a slash and I used it a lot. I found a lot of unique two-handed swords and I was always very curious about their special abilities. In order to perform these special abilities, the game requires you to be a certain level and they usually cost a lot of energy. You will have to manage your energy resource, but it's not that aggressive like in Souls-like games, it's a lot more forgiving. If you don't spam your special ability, you won't even know it's there. The game requires you to be somewhat precise with your positioning in combat. You can't really take a ton of hits and survive, but this also depends on your defense stats. There are some armor pieces that you will find throughout your campaign, which will boost your defense stat, but this is very rare. It's not like the weapons, which can be found on each enemy and various locations. It's really enjoyable trying to learn the combos on weapons, if not a little bit clumsy. Although a lot of these combos don't seem to be worth it, especially when the combat gets really intense. When you're fighting multiple enemies at once, which will happen quite often, you don't have the time to execute a complicated combo. Maybe if you're really good at this game, but I usually stick with just a couple of simple attacks. I'm not saying that these complicated combos are not worth doing at all. If you manage to pull them off without getting attacked or killed, you'll do a ton of damage. And I always try to memorize the unique ability of each weapon I used. But like I said, most regular enemies can just be killed with simple attacks. We should really talk about the gore, which makes the combat very enjoyable. If you didn't notice already, you can cut enemies in various ways. You get the same treatment if you get killed by the way, it's very brutal. Cutting enemies in half never gets boring in this game. I think I'm saying that a lot for all games that have dismemberment features. But still, the gore effects are very enjoyable in Blade of Darkness and it's one of the staples of this combat system. All weapons have durability as well, which means they can break. It takes a while for that to happen, so I didn't find it very annoying. There is something very addictive about the gameplay in these older games and I can't quite put my finger on it. The level design might be one of those things. I absolutely love the old school level design and the maps you're going to explore are pretty big and vertical. All of these maps have a lot of verticality in terms of multiple floors and different areas to explore. You'll usually need to find keys for certain doors, which makes you explore the whole map, but it never feels tedious. Sometimes the game will dial this up and you'll need to find multiple items on the map to open a door or lift in this particular case. The game tells you very little about what you need to do so you can get stuck sometimes. That can certainly get annoying but the map design is very well done which makes it more bearable. If you remember when we talked about Shadows Awakening I mentioned how the maps are obviously not designed around the old school modes. However in this game you can clearly tell it's designed around this philosophy. Even though you don't know what exactly you need to do, or where you need to go, you'll figure it out by just exploring the map. It never got boring, and I rarely went in circles around the map before I stumbled upon the item I need to progress further. The only thing I didn't like that much is how the game respawns some enemies. For example, I would clean this area of enemies completely, and when I came back after a while, after exploring the other side of the map, the enemies would respawn. I mean, it's not a huge deal, but it feels very cheap. The boss fights are kinda weak in this game because they're usually not that interesting to fight. They just have a ton of health and they fight like a buffed up version of regular enemies. Some of them are unique but fighting them never felt that good. It's just a bunch of moving out of the way and trying to land a hit on them. Wait a minute, that sounds a lot like modern Souls-like games, does it? I didn't hate the boss fights though, I just think they're not the best part about this game. Overall, I love this game and I can't wait to replay it with some other character.
number one, Silver Fall. Silver Fall is an action RPG released in 2007. I think this is one of the most requested game in the comments of my previous videos. After playing this game for a while, I can see why people wanted me to cover it. It's a pretty enjoyable RPG, although very flawed in certain areas. First of all, this game doesn't really run all that well on modern PCs, well, at least not on mine. Choosing the settings for the game is done by running the external program, which is completely messed up if your desktop resolution is full HD or higher than that. But no matter which setting I selected, the game just runs like crap. It will frequently drop to 30 FPS or even below that. These are not just frame drops, it's almost the average FPS I had throughout the entire game. To be honest, it didn't bother me that much because the gameplay in Silver Fall is pretty slow, it's not skill based. Although it's still kinda annoying because you would expect this old game to run properly, on modern PCs, when it comes to the FPS at least. Another technical issue on modern PCs is the resolution or the UI scaling to be more precise. Everything is very small on full HD or higher resolutions, so I recommend downloading the mod to fix that. It makes the game a lot more enjoyable and easier to read. Despite all those technical issues, I have to say that I absolutely love this game. Silverfall didn't age all that well when it comes to graphics, and to make things worse, it doesn't run that great, like I said before. The game mixes fantasy and some steampunk elements, which works pretty well. When you start the game, you have the option to make your character. There are different races to pick and some light character customization. The tutorial for the game is a crucial part of the story, so I wouldn't recommend skipping it, even though it's kinda annoying with all the walls of text. The city of Silverfall has been attacked by some undead creatures, and you take the control of an archmage who is trying to defend the city. That's just in the tutorial, and shortly after this you get to control the character you created. Your task is to look for supplies outside of the city and help the refugee camp. The daughter of the Archmage, Kara, is one of the main characters, and most of the main quests are revolved around her. The game doesn't waste a lot of your time on the introduction, and the quests are pretty simple in general. There is a nice morality system, which seems to slightly affect the story and some gameplay elements as well. Technology and nature are two options you have, and selecting different dialogue options will affect this bar. There are certain items that will require you to have a technology or nature points, and you also get unique skills to learn, depending on the stats. I was kinda surprised how well this system works. It makes the dialogue a lot more interesting and it also affects the gameplay in a way. Speaking of dialogue, the writing is decent, although the story itself is very simple and not very interesting. It lacks proper plot twists and memorable characters. When it comes to the gameplay, Silverfall plays like a simplified CRPG with real-time combat. You only control one character, but you'll be able to have a couple of followers. I only figured this out after a couple of hours of gameplay, because in order to recruit some of the followers, you need to do their side quest. The side quests didn't seem that interesting to me, so I ignored most of them. By the way, that's not a great idea, because you can easily hit a brick wall if you just follow the main quest. The game doesn't play around, you can easily die in combat if you're undergeared or underleveled. There is some level scaling in Civil Fall, but different areas will have certain level cap for enemies. Which means that you can encounter some very high level enemies that can easily kill you. Doing side quests, exploring the map and killing some more enemies is kinda necessary. You could say the game requires some amount of grinding, but the gameplay is pretty fun and simple so I don't have any problems with this. And if I'm not mistaken, the level scaling used to be way worse in the original game, before the quality of life improvements in the complete version. Even though you can get a couple of followers, you can only control the character you made. The followers will automatically do their thing. Although you can talk with them and give them a couple of different commands and customize their gear. You control your character with WASD movement keys or by point and click. The camera controls are a bit obnoxious and moving your character on the map can be very frustrating. That's because the collision in this game is terrible, you can easily get stuck on the terrain. In moments like this, which are plenty of throughout the whole game, Silverfall feels extremely unpolished. Moving your character on the map should never feel this bad in a game. Speaking of the map, you're going to visit a lot of different looking zones. Silverfall looks pretty bad in certain areas, even for a 2007 game. The level of detail in these areas is very low, but all of the zones have a very nice vibe to them. As you would expect, there is a ton of items of different quality to loot. Killing stronger enemies is almost always rewarding because they seem to have a high chance for a good item drop. 
especially elite enemies and bosses. The crafting in this game is very good as well. You can invest some points into crafting skill and get a lot of options to customize the item you want to make. The materials you need are easy to acquire because almost every single enemy will drop something. The combat itself is very simple but very fun. I invested a lot of points into melee skills while I had one of my followers to heal me and another one to deal some ranged damage. You can build your character as a tank and some skills will support that playstyle but I wanted to focus more on dealing damage. Whatever you do as a melee character, you will need to invest some points into defensive skills. The thing is, if your main character dies in combat, your whole party is instantly dead. However, there is no game over screen, you just get to respawn in the last place you visit. Enemies you kill will remain dead, but if you are killed by a boss, he will completely regenerate. NPCs do respawn though, but only if you use the fast travel option or if you reload the game. I think the challenge in the game was decent on the normal difficulty, even though I'm not so crazy about level scaling games. The level scaling is not nearly as aggressive like in some other RPGs and the progression system is pretty good in Silverfall. You will instantly notice the difference once you find or craft a stronger item and acquiring new skills give you a similar feeling. Silverfall Earth Awakening can be purchased as a standalone game, but it's more like an expansion pack for the original game. This version of the game introduces some notable quality of life improvements like the brand new UI, a couple of new playable races and of course new content. I believe that most of these improvements are included in the base game as well. In the complete version I mean. When you start the game you get the option to play as a level 1 character or make a level 45 character so you can start Earth Awakening right away. But if you complete the base game you can just continue the expansion with the existing character. I still have to complete this expansion, so I didn't form a complete opinion about it. I'm enjoying it so far, but that's because I like the base game despite all of its flaws. Silverfall can feel very rough around the edges, to put it lightly, but I would still recommend trying it out if you like these types of games. The gameplay is simplistic, but it doesn't lack the depth. You can get a lot of hours of fun if you can tolerate all the issues I mentioned. You can grab the complete bundle on GOG with the base game and the expansion for around 10 bucks. I'll have GOG links in the description. And those will be all the games for this episode. This is very confusing. Tell me which game you think is the best and would you try playing some of them? Leave a comment down below. I'll have some GOG links for these games, so if you decide to buy some of them, I'll get a small contribution. And if you want to support my channel, maybe you can get yourself a cool C4G t-shirt. I just made a bunch of new cool designs. You can always become a Patreon or a YouTube member if that's what you prefer. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is to watch the video and subscribe. Many thanks to all of my current supporters and I'll see you in the next one.